Thanks, Chris. What do we got going on? Crowdfunding round up! Because that's what we're doing this week. A little bit from last week, too, because I skipped it because my brother had his wedding. Yeah, you're looking at the best man right here. Hmm. <laughs> Say what you will about that. Make the jokes in the comment section. I got nothing else. What do we got going on this week? Let's go. Look, in case you missed my video from earlier in the week, I talked about Cascadero, and I'm hoping to have another video of talking about Cascadito in the near future. I've already talked about Zuvetus, Bitewing Games, me, Zuvetus, Cascadero, their best games, period. I'll stand by that. Cascadero, though, in the line of the other Kinesia tile lane games. They're all still sitting next to me right here because I didn't move them because I was too lazy since the video. But what do you need to know about Cascadero? Well, it's got a double-sided board that you're going to be slowly laying down these envoys on and around these hexes of these towns. And so you have to have at least two when you connect to the town, meaning you cannot touch the town before you connect. If you do, you don't score points. But the points are not actually points because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be moving up the right side of the board or on the far side of this picture here. And if we can find a blown up picture of it right here, you're going to be slowly slotting up in five different colors of these towns ways to get victory points, as well as the center of the board is going to offer you asymmetric conditions that are going to allow you to get additional points. There are going to be six of them that are community, meaning you can get any of them. Everybody can get any of them. Doesn't really matter. But there's also six at the top that only one person can get, the first person that gets them. You play until basically when somebody runs out of your envoys. And you can manipulate on the board a little bit. You can get a little extra turn. On the other side of version of it, there's farmers that are going to be available to position and to take for additional victory points as well as additional actions. The seals that are going to give you allowing you, the seals are present as well in the little groove dark spots on this column, if you will, that allow you to play that worker next to an area. Now, the tricky part is with this is first is the worst, second is the best, as the old kid's rhyme goes, because if you're first touching a city, well, you're only going to get to move up potentially one, maybe two slots. But if you're second, third, or fourth, you're going to get to move an additional slot, so two perhaps even three. Now I say perhaps even an additional one there, the two and the three on those both respectively. And that's because if there is a Herald, this little white guy right here on top of it, it now gets you two if you're first, three if you're second, third or fourth, as opposed to the normal one and two. The depth of strategy is on how you're playing the envoys. The rule book is simple, it's straightforward, it works. Check out my video if you want, check out their videos, check out the rule book, it's all there. There you go, I really like it. I really, really like this game, and this is basically giving you a roll and write version. Now again, I have the copy, it's sitting in my backpack right now, I need to finish up with that, but hopefully I'll have something out next week so you can know a little bit more if this roll and write is for you. Again, Zoo Vedas is a great, great, great sort of auction style management game? but you need a higher player count. You really need three to five for Zuvetus. You really do. It can be done at two, but I would recommend at least three to five. I can see my copy sitting right over there behind the camera. And I love this. This fits a notch differently than all these other games that I talked about, right? It's gonna be about the length of Blue Lagoon. It's gonna have more of the strategy of Babylonia, but it's done in a reverse way because you're slowly wanting to not be first around those areas as like with Babylonia, you're trying to be first oftentimes. You're trying to get the most around a single hex in the first place. And so it fits nicely. It's very teachable. It's incredibly easy to learn to play. And that's why I love it. And that's why you should be thinking about getting it. Now, again, do you need the deluxifications with some of this other stuff? Yeah, you don't really necessarily. But Zuvetus is a game I need to get played more this year so I can figure out whether or not it's going to be in my top 10 as well. I, I don't know how I'm going to feel about Cascadero. <laughs> Caveat there. Cascadero is going to hit my top 10. It's just whether or not I count it on the 2023s with the Kickstarter copy right now that I have, the preview copy prototype, versus waiting for the copy next year and counting it on 2024s. It's that good, folks. It's that good. $4 for shipping if you're in North America. That's freaking amazing, actually. Anywhere continental North America, that is. Take that for what it is, though. This is a Kinesia masterpiece. I love this game. Uh, Bitewing Games, thanks for sending it to me again. But you know what? It was destined to be because I have all the other ones. So, Little Plastic Trains got $100,000. freaking That's $100 per person that they're spending on little trains. Is that cool with you? Train sets? I mean, get thematic incorporation if you want. I have no idea. I just thought I'd cover this because... You've got your 18XXers, you've got your regular train folks, you've got your Ticket to Riders going all over this thing. Um, and apparently, you know, board game accessories are a thing on channels now too. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Huh. There you go. You want to buy some little mini trains? 
My three-year-old would love this, but I'm not going to spend $100 when we can go to Walmart, Walgreens, Myers, or any of those other little Target-like places and buy them for a dollar. So <laughs> I got to spend my money somewhere else, right? Irune, Light and Darkness expansion, $150,000 basically at the time of me filming this. This is an expansion. This is a heavily, heavily voice-based, they say, app, but it's a very, very heavily dungeon crawl based app that you're going to be doing this with. And the new light and darkness expansion is going to offer you, I believe a new mode of playing is the main active component of this, because what you're doing is you're essentially doing a cooperative dungeon crawl. Uh, you have your sort of your phase and then the enemy phase, and you have this event phase that's going to go along with it. And you're taking a certain number of actions, a la most dungeon crawls, and it's going to be heavily, heavily though app based, and it's going to take a lot of the minutia or the all of the overhead out of it. I mean, it even says you can learn straight from the app. You don't even have to read a rule book, even though there is a 40 page rule book on the page. So that's going to be the main crux of this game. But what is the new expansion offering? Well, it's offering, I believe, the Master of Shadows version, which essentially adds, in addition, a one versus all mode. So that's okay. And there's also an arena mode. There's a solo cooperative mode. So it's got all of the modes you could possibly think of. And it'll do everything from leveling up for you, keeping traffic experience for you, doing all the events for you, all of that stuff. Here are the four modes that I just talked about. You can customize it as well with quests. And like I said, here you go. This is it, right? The Master of Shadows versus the Adventurers multiple endings that are going to affect things. Now, I don't know how the Master of Shadows, I mean, that's like a one versus all like campaign game. So that's a little weird, although it reminds me of the others. So I don't know. So the price levels here, though, just the expansion, and this is the tricky part, right? Just the expansion with the brand new Kickstarter exclusive content is going to cost you almost $100. Then you have the Legendary Pledge, which says it's all in, but it's really not all in because you go up here and this is the all in, all in with both expansions and the core for like $250. So that's a lot of money. And this master pledge um, gets you a bunch of the add-ons too, because they've got a bunch of add-on deluxifications down here. They've got a few stretch goals, a little bit of content, a little bit of extra to go in with the app. You'd take it for what it is. I mean, I, again, I'm looking through the rule book. I didn't see anything that made me think this is drastically different than some of the other dungeon crawlers out there. But with the saturation of the dungeon crawler market in the first place, I feel like this one um, has kind of been lost in the shuffle. But that being said, I just don't see a lot of people talking about it. I saw it come up on Facebook Marketplace a few times after the first one delivered a couple of months ago, but it's just kind of one that I wasn't really too much aware of the first time around either. So I think it looks kind of nifty, but this is definitely a try before I buy with any dungeon crawl nowadays, almost that's going to cost me this much money. So if you love it, I mean, a new expansion is $100, folks. Now, the interesting thing, and I give them a lot of kudos down here, because you see all this miniature, 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 and I probably passed over the link already. But if I don't find it, essentially what they've got on this page is they've got a link to a form that says, hey, if you're interested in a standee version, let us know. Click this link. We're polling people, and we want to see if people are interested. So I give them a lot of kudos for doing that, because you don't even see people willing to discuss that. It's either like an all or nothing. Here you go. Here's the standee version right there. So you can click right there and go over to it, and they'll fill out the form and see if they can do it enough later on. So I give them kudos for doing that. Narrative campaign, though, with an app-based system, I know why people don't like it, but it also kind of is nice at the same time because it might take up some of the overhead that some of the problems with dungeon crawls and getting them played repeatedly in a meta-style campaign have in the first place. So there you go. So board game butler. Apparently, again, we're throwing around the accessories this week. Uh, you want something to make your board game flat and you want to raise $13,000? I mean, that's kind of cool, I guess guess no more binders clips or 3d parts you just put it over that it attaches it and keeps it flat on the sides with little clips essentially so i don't know engineered to make it work so there was a demand people are buying it and oh <laughs> dice tower preview <laughs> uh, well you know what uh, I guess accessories aren't immune to paid previews either more at this point. So, ah, whatever, it's fine. If you're interested, though, go check it out. Davy Jones's Locker Expansion Week continues. Curse of the Ghost Ships Expansion. No, I don't know why I went with that accent. $44,000. It's almost 150% funded. So the base game of this is, I believe, more of a cooperative version of fighting off a Kraken. And it's played over two phases. The first phase is basically you take three actions per turn of the 11 available actions, and you get to wander around the sea pirating, pillaging, looting, repairing, upgrading your ship. And when you hit enough different events uh, that get played every turn, so it's got sort of a dead of winter vibe where every turn an event card gets picked up. So enough of the Kraken modifiers, I believe, three of them get pulled, then you flip, you just wipe the board, you flip it over and it goes to the Kraken side and you have to fight off the Kraken. New expansion here is gonna give you the Banshee ship 
and you're sending it back to its watery grave as opposed to just the Kraken. And the new mechanic, new character, new pirate ship that all is going to go along with this allows you to siphon souls instead of just using your cannons like you would normally use to shoot at the Kraken in the first place. And so that's going to be allowing you to interact and, you know, deprive the Banshee of being able to attack you apparently as much as well. And it's going to say, as the comments down here below do, that it's going to not only allow one ship to be powerful, because as well, otherwise they give you like six asymmetric ships, each with strengths and weaknesses, and they allow you to tailor it in that first phase of things. But it's going to make all of them potentially more powerful and not just like the one who specializes in super good attacks, right? Uh, new board, new map, new items, new mechanic of possession, new equipment, and the siphoning that I mentioned previously. So now it's not terribly expensive for the expansion, $40 for the expansion, but the base game alone is going to cost you twice that as well. I like the idea of the double-sidedness. I like the idea of the you know, play mat I think they have down here. They have a bunch of other um, additional deluxifications. But this one, again, as an exploration flip over boss battle, I don't know. Again, try before I buy on this one for me personally. But, you know, I like cooperative, and so I don't really have anything pirate-wise. I think I previewed Seas of Havoc like a year or two ago, which was okay. It just didn't quite vibe with me as much as I would have liked. And, you know, Feed the Kraken is your deduction game. But again, I kind of have passed on that one too. And so, I don't know. I'm looking for a pirate game. There's been a couple of this open world-ish, open ocean-ish, I guess I should say, games in the last couple of years. So, there's a couple of videos down here, preview content you can check out if you're interested and go from there. So play it online, I guess, if you're really, really interested, because that's the best way to go. But there you go. Indie Indie Game, because I've not also seen this one on the secondary market hardly at all, and I've really not looked at retailers, but I don't think you're gonna find it there much either. Side note here, as I'm scrolling through the projects, trying to find all the ones from the past two weeks, what's really interesting is I sometimes forget some of these projects are still ongoing, even though I've covered them like two, even three or more weeks ago. I mean, all of these seem to be slowly ending at the time of me filming this, right? You can see Final Girl right there still. And then that was a little shorter one overall. Vagrant Song is ending soon. Uh, Flock Together is ending hours away. Defenders is ending hours away. Um, just all of these other ones. Rock and Stone with uh, Deep Rock Galactic. And you just have all of these other ones that I wasn't even you know, remembering sometimes, right? Like Canopy there is ending. And then we have down here, I think we had Rivals as well right there. So just games that I covered that I'm like, oh yeah, it's still going. Kind of neat. Anyway, side ramble over. Next up, Night Cage, Shrieking Hollow, Labyrinth, candle-based tile laying game where you're slowly flipping over these tiles but also flipping them back over because you have a tile and a candle that is only illuminating the ones around you and so you're slowly exploring trying to take out the monster and prevent them from essentially winning the game and this expansion because again apparently this is expansion week expansion is going to be giving you a new boss that you're going to be fighting against that is going to take up like half the freaking board and you're going to be able to like climb down into the monster's pit as it's coming out to try and prevent it as the shrieking hollow right so it's got kind of the horror vibe. Again, I've seen this one that kind of uh, very divisive. Board Game Geek rating is like a 7. But I've seen people that really absolutely fantastically love this game. And other people that are just like, this is not me whatsoever, right? And that's just kind of interesting when it happens like that. What you've got going on, again, you're illuminating the ones around you. You move, you get through, you need to get each of the keys find the gates and escape with a team, but the bad guy's gonna be doing stuff along the way to kind of prevent you from doing so. Again, preview videos, a little bit of stretch goals here, so you can see a little bit of what's on the page. There's enough information on Board Game Geek that I you know, feel like you can get a relatively good sense of what the game actually is. So I pull up the rule book here just to give you an illustration of what it is, right? Like this is the hollow board over here. This is the main board over here that you're gonna be dealing with. And like I mentioned, this is what's offering being new in this campaign. And the fact, I just wish some of this stuff was on the page itself because there's very little information, even though, like I said, there's a bunch of information on Board Game Geek. There's a bunch of reviews. This is like a 2019 game, I think. But this is just the stuff that I would love to have on the page. And it kind of shows you how this mechanism of falling is gonna potentially take. And then it's going to leave or go into the hollow, depending on how you do that, going back to the main board in addition to the sideboard that you're going to be utilizing. And you can see that this thing is creeping up the side there, trying to escape as a whole. So I think that's a cool mechanism. As we look through this and they give you a couple more examples, I guess it's probably not going to change your opinion of the base game, though, with this being very similar in the same sense. Again, I just wish there was more actual content on the page. I wish there was the rule book of the base game so people could see, like, if you're not familiar with this in the first place, there, again, it's one of those expansions where there's nothing necessarily to entice you of why you would be getting this now, what you should know about this. It just runs you through, again, pictures of content and why, you know, they're putting out an expansion, which is fine, but an acrylic is cool because that's what they're getting here. Acrylic, you know, pieces to go along with it is a deluxification, 
Just wish there was a little more on there. I wish I didn't have to hop over to Board Game Geek. Um, easily could, though. So, I don't know. Night Cage, again, this is one I'd love to try, but because it's so relatively, you know, divisive in what people like or don't like from a cooperative sense, I could see myself going either way. I'm not afraid of a 7.0 rating. I just need to know if it's right for me, and sometimes, you know, hands-on is first. So, there you go. Pick up the base game first if you want. Maybe come back and late back this later if you're so interested. Merchants of Magic! 250% of its funding goal at launch last week. Still has over two weeks left at the time of filming this. You're getting two new expansions in this slightly heavier roll and write style game, which basically takes D&D &D and Bargain Quest and combines them into that thematic incorporation, if you will. And I just kind of like the idea of it. Going around to your different shops, managing, micromanaging, and adding new ways of being able to interact in this. So you're getting the Dangerous Business as well as the Draw of Dragons expansions here with this. And so they run you through, again, what's new. They're getting different sponsored boards as well as new adventure sheets that are going to go along with this. They're going to give you ways to defeat new creature cards by leveling up your character. 100 new sheets. Okay, great. I am still waiting for a really good dry erase roll and write. That's why I really liked the original Let's Make the Bus Route from Japan because that's what that kind of was. Now, what are you getting here? You're getting new creature cards that you combine with adventure cards, and you get a little bit more combinations and combos of crafting, as well as making your sponsored adventure just more powerful. And so you get your one strong enough to defeat the special monster there. Well, you get more coin, you get more you know, victory points as well. Better solo mode, and then you get the dragon module down here. 16 extra order cards for matching magic items with enchantments. So... I mean, this has probably been the hottest roll and write on my wish list for a while. But again, I, I feel so weird about roll and writes. We, roll and writes are very hard for me to judge sight unseen. Very, very difficult. Because I, the dynamic is just so different. So different than any other game. And I, I don't mean that as a bad thing. I mean that as a, you know what, that's kind of cool at the same time. But it's also tough then to go out on a limb and back these on crowdfunding just not knowing. So... You're rolling dice simultaneously. You all action select, including where you could add the new expansion modular. You're basically spending these dice for options and actions, including crafting items. Going through, using that coin, defeating new creatures in that phase as well, and then passing around until 10 rounds are up. A few unlocks here that they're just throwing in for free. A few uh, little upcoming events, a few video coverages here if you want as well. I mean, this is probably one of the ones I would say from Rock Manor Games, which reminds me, I'm sorry, Rock Manor Games. I actually have Maximum Apocalypse um, Wasted Wild sitting down here. It's on my uh, short list of re upcoming reviews. So I apologize if you're watching this. You're probably not watching this. I'm too small of a channel. But Mike, it's coming soon. I promise. I promise. Uh, and so give them a shout out. I believe this was a little bit harder to get at retail. I'm not sure this one originally made it super wide retail. So take that for what you will. But I mean, this is probably, again, one of the few roll and rights I would probably maybe consider picking up Sight Unseen in the future just by the action and the nature and the mechanics and the fact that I'm a sucker for a little bit of a dark type fantasy RPG-esque feel. And that's just my sweet spot, blind spot. So there you go. Now we have Burn the Witch! She's a witch. She turned me into a newt. Anyway, um, we have social deduction on the brain, apparently. And what this is offering is a slight spin on the werewolf mafia type of game. And what you've got going on here is you have basically villages. You don't have a character, individual character, right? You have a village or a, a hut. And each of your huts is going to have a certain number of villagers in them. And what you do is you lay out your villagers. And they're going to have traits that are essentially going to be uh, apparent face up. And so with the accusation each round, they choose a trait that is common among many types of villagers. And then you go ahead and you vote, essentially, and say whether or not you want to burn somebody with that trait or save somebody with that trait. And then you put all your votes in, and this is the tricky part, right? You put in an equal number of votes to the number of villagers still left in and under your control. So if you have, say, I think they say in a four-player game, you're each going to have five villagers. And so then you put in five votes. But then as your villagers get taken out, you're going to have less votes. You're never player eliminated. You're still allowed to participate, it says. There's no player elimination. But there kind of is if you run out of villagers. You can still talk, but you can't actually vote or execute. So you're passing around just like a secret Hitler sort of way of who is the accuser, who is the executor based on, you know, turn by turn by turn basis. It says that it's going to take you somewhere between 45 and 75 minutes to either have enough uh, sympathizers, because it's sympathizers and zealots, sympathizers for the witches, zealots going after the witches, to either get rid of all of the witches, have them all revealed and burned, or have enough um, innocence 
slaughtered, essentially burned at the stake. And then the witches and sympathizers win. So that's what they've got going on here. This is the game in a nutshell. A few videos, a little action summary here. If you want to take a look at that, the rules are there. You can play it online a little bit as well. Gives you a little bit more of the background. Apparently there's going to be a little bit of an expansion here. Houses and heretics. Going to give you a little bit more of a third asymmetric faction that has to survive the witch hunt. And you have to get all the heretics as well, or the heretics win in addition. But the heretics also have to discover all the witches. So, um... Yeah, okay. What's houses doing? Houses asymmetric power to the houses to start off with. So houses sounds actually kind of cooler than heretics. Three is a little bit difficult to manage, especially with a metagame. This has to be uh, your favorite game to play it, essentially, when repeated play, if you will. Sort of like a lighter version of Blood on the Clock Tower, kind of-ish. Maybe slightly less asymmetric though overall, but, you know, social deduction, crowdfunding. There you go. Next up here, Coupon Clipper from Bluebeard Entertainment. The same folks who did Sunshine City, the roll and write that used a generator to give you a different layout of every single game. And now they've done it with Coupon Clipper here, where you're literally cutting up these sheets. It's a print and play, and you get $12 for the infinite generator. You just mix and match, you print them off, and you pass, essentially. What you've got going on is it's not a roll and write where you're passing stuff around, but it's a cut and write. So you're basically making two cuts uh, in different directions where you either hit the edge of the page or you hit another cut. Any coupons you cut out, you do a set collection type manner by the end of the game, and you just do that until you pass it around enough times that you've got all the coupons cut out. So that's what you've got going on there in a the game. So that's all you need to know. It's a print and play campaign, just like Sunshine City was. And yeah, five or twelve dollars. So that's all I got to say. Coupon clipper. There we go. So next up, we have Keyforge Grim Reminders from Ghost Galaxy. Almost $200,000. The sixth edition, this is the seventh edition, seventh cycle, if you will, was on GameFound, I don't know, a year or two ago, and they raised over a million dollars. Now, they're already almost at $200,000 in the first day. If you're not familiar with Keyforge, eventually at the bottom here, they give you the overview, but what you're going to be doing is you're going to be playing these cards. You're going to have a 36-card deck. Three different factions, or houses as they're called in this game, are going to be contained in your deck, and there are going to be 12 cards of each faction. But the different and the big twist on this CCG model is the sense that well, the decks are all completely unique. There are no two decks ever that are the same. That's the whole sort of formulation uh, modular system that they've developed with this, with this algorithm, this generator, speaking of things from earlier, that they've got going on with them. And that's kind of been their claim to fame, if you will. And so it gives you a little bit of the new stuff here, right? New house, 250 cards from some of the old houses as well. The new scrap mechanic and a new haunted state so okay new rare revenant cards as well and discard does something else new different but the question always is do you need this do you really want like buying a bunch of decks that don't suit you i mean i think of it like mythic mischief behind me right like you buy that game and there's four factions in it and maybe you only like two of them are you okay with having two factions that you're just not going to like as well but you've paid for already in that sense it's sort of like this right you're going to find maybe a deck or two that you really like and maybe people really love the appeal of playing with a new deck every single time right playing with a new game every single time uh you have game night that doesn't happen to anyone does it um uh, $60 is going to get you in, $75 is going to get you a bunch, and you can spend up to, you know, $500 if you really want a whole bunch of stuff to go along with it. Or, just kidding, you can get up to $2,000 worth of stuff. And this $2,000 one is actually completely sold out at the time of me filming this. That's crazy. What is this actually offering? Oh, that's what it's offering. You get your own little thing immortalized. By the way, you're also getting a stuffy. This gets you 144 decks, folks. $2,000, 144 decks. What the deuce are you going to... You, you, you can't even play 144 board games. Now, granted, I guess at least with this, you don't have to relearn the rules every time. And what you're doing essentially, though, if you're not familiar with this game as a nutshell, is you're collecting this ember over here on your turn-by-turn -turn basis. And if you have enough ember on your turn, you forge a key. You need to forge three keys in order to win the game. What you're going to be doing is reaping, battling, as well as manipulating and playing artifacts and creatures in order to gain that ember in the first place. You can also steal it from your opponents, depending on how clever you are. Bunch of add-ons for this that are mentioned up there earlier. Individual decks, two-player starters, special editions, collector's editions, super great deluxified legendary editions, whatever it may be. Shipping is whatever as well. So do you want more of this? People really like it. I mean, people down here at the bottom, I didn't even know reviewed it. But, you know, there you go. Because you have not only Shut Up and Sit Down, Dice Tower, obviously, and then also NPI. So, yeah. You know, don't need anything else on your page, but those guys, there you go. Keyforge. Give it a look-see. Now, sleeper hit, though. Sleeper. We're going to talk about this one. Patrician, Towers of Influence. It's not funded, but you may not actually recognize the designer's name. I didn't until I got down further, but this is by the designer of Hansa, Hansa Teutonica. 
as well as Colorado. And so this is gonna be a little bit different. You're gonna be having these potentially up to 10 different cities that you can see on this board, and you're gonna be playing your cards on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. You're gonna be laying your pieces on the potential slots in each one of those cities, depending on what card you lay. And then you're gonna be picking up a card that's laid down next to that as, you know, to way to replenish your hand. So you go until the, all the towers are scored, you run out of cards, or you just have everything else that's already been played, played. And so that's what you're gonna be having to deal with as you build these towers, but as you play a card, build a tower and then grab a card the last portion of things is really where the nuance comes in is because you're gonna have special actions that are allow you to manipulate pieces that are on the top of said towers to the other tower potentially that's in the same area or another tower that's in the same area so that's going to be where the influence goes because you can only stack so many pieces on each of these towers until you have to score them for the end game in an area control style manner as you can see here that's the game in a nutshell it's gonna cost you 31 dollars double-sided board they offer you a little bit of advanced uh gameplay content here with two modules as well as a kickstarter set of asymmetric um objectives that you can begin the game with as well michael shot i'm mispronouncing that i'm sure i'm sorry but looks actually like a pretty nice game and that's what they're going for they're going for that hansa style feel in terms of you know what ease of play ease of rules overhead yes uh depth of strategy in the actual game not the thickness of the rule book so want to play it on tabletop simulator go right ahead right now i mean i don't think it's gonna be beat price wise at retail and i don't really think you're gonna find it at retail either so calopy games is putting one out there and there you go side note here at the end of the video like i don't know what is going on or like i feel like my video quality has gone down. The camera, I bought a new lens like five months ago, a better one for the main camera. The overhead one is like really good, but I feel like I just don't have the settings right on this main camera. And I, a couple of people have commented, you know, Jeremy Howard in the comment section were like, dude, what camera are you using? Like switch your cameras. I'm like, if it was that easy, dude, I would do it. I would do it. I would do it. Because I know that's limiting people from wanting to watch me at times because like the grainy resolution apparently on this main camera is part of the problem. And I have like an HDMI cord and I thought it was supposed to be recording in HDMI, but like then I changed the camera settings and the framework and the frames per second settings. So I don't know if it's going to be any better, if the resolution is going to be any better. I don't know. I mean, this is a really well thought of lens and I thought it was a lens issue but I, I don't I'm not tech savvy with this stuff I'm not I'm like tech savvy on the computer but like if you try and look this stuff up too there's like no help guide there's no how to you know you type in some of this stuff and it gets you like completely other stuff as well so I don't know the problem is I'd love to use this camera as that camera but this one doesn't have a good setup hookup to the computer and vice versa so ah it's annoying creator stuff right because I know the overhead stuff looks absolutely fantastic on some of the gameplay and the overview stuff. I just need to get this looking better. And I think even this video, like since I just adjusted it right before filming this, that the, the coloring is like slightly off now. It looks a little bit yellowish to me on my own screen. But I don't know. Whatever. If someone's tech savvy in there, you can help me out in the comment section. Shoot me an email. <laughs> I don't know. What else is going on? Uh, kids got two soccer games this weekend. Got a Saturday afternoon and a Sunday afternoon game because they didn't have one last weekend, so they're apparently making up for it. Um, yeah. I got to get some stuff played. Also, out this weekend, Old King's Crown. A couple days, two, three days. I uh, have a video for that. And then I got to get something out for Time Strike and Source, the Heroescape-esque big box that is massively sitting behind the camera right now because... That's a lot of stuff, and it's cool, and you need to know about it. So that one still has two weeks, though, but hopefully have at least one video. Out. Not sure I'm going to have two, but we'll see. We'll see how big one video is, and maybe split it into two. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Stay classy. Thanks for watching. We're, we're creeping up there towards 10K. That's all I'm going to say. See you around.